Yeah. Um, from yeah. what is being distributed, I guess you already know who is next. Um, Steve Garvey is in the house. Um, thanks for being here. And uh, I think he doesn't need an introduction, so I pass uh, right over to him and he can uh, speak about his views on IoT, software modernization, and a bit of baseball, maybe also. Yeah? They're huge. That's the hey. best introduction I've had in a long time. Good job, by the way. <laughs> Would you invest that for me in one of the companies here? I just tipped them over here for a second. So, uh, Hi, everybody. I've been on the on-deck circle for a while. Um, I'm not going to say I've, I've been out there too long, but the, uh, the Cubs just won yeah. the World Series. Yeah. First of all, how many people thought I was taller? Raise your hands. Come on, you can give it up. I know, I know. My buddies over there were watching, yeah. I got a better strike zone this size than everybody. Okay, how many Giant fans do we have? Good. Oh, a little reluctant this year, huh? It's the off year. Giant fan? Yeah, okay. You probably are just smiling because my Dodgers are on the precipice of uh, being eliminated. That's right. But Kershaw's on the mound, arguably the greatest pitcher of, of our year. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor and pleasure for me to be with you. Um, I'm a guy who was an only child and uh, ended up with five daughters in a row. So uh, I don't get a chance to talk very much, so you give me a chance to get out of the house. <laughs> How many guys have daughters here? You know what I'm talking about, right? If we really get it, we realize we're on this earth to serve. And we pick our spots when we can you know, get our ideas in. Uh, finally had two boys, uh, Ryan and Sean. So uh, I no longer live in a sorority house. I have a little bit of a testosterone flowing in there, too. Um, I've been very, very blessed. Uh, at the age of seven, growing up in Tampa, Florida, um, late in spring training of that year, my dad, uh, who was a grand bus driver, came home uh, to dinner, and he looked at me and said, uh, you want to skip school today? I said, yeah, gosh. What are we going to do, Dad? He said, well, tomorrow I'm going to pick up the bus about 7 o'clock, and, uh, and now you and I are going to drive to the tarmac of uh, Tampa International Airport, and we're going to pick up the Brooklyn Dodgers, who are flying in on their own plane, and take them to St. Petersburg to play the Yankees in an exhibition game. And, God, Dad, really? Wow. The world champions? He said, yeah. They had just beaten the Yankees for the first time in the fall of 1955, and, and they were the world champions. It was the boys of summer. It was, it was Gil Hodges and Duke Snyder and Carl Ferrillo and Roy Campanella and Jackie Robinson. And uh, these were the boys of summer. And, and my dad and two other gentlemen had just started the second Little League in Tampa, Florida. So uh, the next weekend, I would be playing my first Little League game. So. Um, I said, Dad, can, can, can I be excused? And I ran into my room and, and uh, went under my bed, and I was starting to collect Topps uh, baseball cards. And I had six Brooklyn Dodger cards and a Have a Tampa cigar box back then. And I brought them back to the table. And my parents were from New York, and my mother was a Yankee fan, so she was always smiling. They won all the time. And my dad was a Dodger fan, so he had a little bit of room to gloat at that time. And uh, I showed him my Reese card, and he told me about the captain number one, and then uh, about the, uh, the, the utility second baseman, Jim Gilliam, who would sit around uh, chewing gum and was always there ready to go, and Snyder, the Duke, and then Campanella, and then finally Jackie Robinson. So the next morning, of course, I, I couldn't go to sleep, and we got up, and we got the bus, and we drove to the tarmac of Tampa International Airport, and, and about 8 o'clock, all of a sudden, a DC-7 prop jet landed and had Dodgers on the side and a baseball on the on the tail, pretty heady stuff for a, for a young kid. And it went by and it came back and there were no A7, B22, you know, gates. They pushed the gate up to the plane when the door opened up. And, uh, and off came the great manager, Walter Alston, and then these players. And, and my wife and I did a book about, um, oh, probably about seven years ago called My Bat Boy Days. And we talk about this first moment where I stood there with my baseball cards, and as these gentlemen came by, we were in the front of the bus, 
we said in this book, it was as if these great players came to life. Because if you remember as a kid and the things you were interested in, if maybe you got close to somebody that you thought was really neat or was a hero of yours or an idol, they came to life because they were actually living, breathing people. And as they went by, you know, back then we wore those, uh, the flat tops with the butch wax and it stood up like this. Each guy would patted me on the head to see if it was really that spiky, you know. And my dad's 6'4 and about 220, and I'm not. So the moral is don't pat your kids on the head when you're young like that. It'll affect the cerebellum or something like that, and that was it. But uh, we got on the bus, and 20 minutes later, we're in St. Pete, and the guys are getting off the bus and, and grabbing their bags to go in the clubhouse, and a little man comes out in boxer shorts and a little strapped T-shirt and a little cigar, and I would find out later he was the clubhouse man, and he, he looked at me, and he said, hey, kid, you want a bat boy? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, get the bats and balls out there. They'll be out in 15 minutes. So the bat bag was this high, and the ball bag was too tough to carry, and my dad helped me, and I went out and laid out everything. And the Yankees were taking batting practice, and I kept hearing, tsh, tsh. And I looked, and there was Mickey Mantle, the great Yankee center field. Every kid loved Mickey. You know, blonde hair, rippling muscles. Ran to first base in about a second, you know. Hit 700-foot home runs. And I was watching him, and all of a sudden I heard, Sonny, you want to play catch? And I turned around, and it was the great Dodger first baseman, Gil Hodges, who was about 6'4", about the same size as my dad. And I said, yes, sir. And back then... Gloves cost about $9.95 for the great ones, and you had it on your belt because your mother said, don't, uh, don't lose that glove. We can't afford more than one. And I got it off, and he tossed to me to see if I could catch. and Got it, threw it back to you, tossed again, and I said, I can catch. I'm starting the Little League next week. And all of a sudden, I heard, Tsh, and I turned around and saw a mantle, and boom, got hit in the chest. And Mr. Hodges came over. He said, son, you all right? And I said, yes, sir, I am. I said, you were, he said, you weren't looking at Mickey Mantle, were you? And I said, yes, sir, I was. And then in one of the first poignant moments of my seven years, he said, son, we're the world champions. Yes, sir, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> and that day I got, to, uh, I got to bat boy for the Dodgers. Now, at the age of seven. And I got to sit on the bench and have Jackie Robinson almost sit in my lap. Many of you know that he was the, the first black player in baseball. April 15, 1947, he took the field. And I would see Snyder hit a home run, and I would see Reese and Hodges on the bench sitting next to him. I'd hear him talking about how the pitcher for the Yankees held the ball. And if he held it like this, it was going to be a fastball. And if he held it like this, it was going to be a curveball. Now, they weren't going to face the Yankees until hopefully seven months later in the, in the World Series. But what they were doing is they were watching and studying to pick up some little tip or hint that would allow them seven months later in the bottom of the ninth inning with a score tied that they may see the pitcher go like this for a curveball and be ready for a curveball and hit it up the middle and win the World Series. That's what successful people do. They watch, they observe, they take notes, they put it in the greatest computer God ever created, our brain, and they prepare. And although I didn't know exactly what they were talking about that day, I would later learn because I started playing. And the irony was after that first day, and I, and I ended up bad boying for seven or eight years, they loved my dad, and. They just came over to Tampa three or four times every year, and, and I grew up with them. I grew up with my idols, and that was the, that's what the book was really about, about growing up with your idols, about learning from your, your idols, about having them talk about the simple things of, of team working, the simple things of, of hitting the cutoff man and why you bunt, right? why you pay pitch and catch to win ball games and win championships. Home runs win games. Right? Good pitching and, and good tight defense wins championships. Okay. You started to learn all these things. And as time went on, 12 years later after that first day at a Michigan State University, it's kind of like a Disney movie, I get drafted in the first round by the Dodgers. How does that happen? Huh? The team that you've grown up with and the team that's taught you a lot of the things that have helped you get to the point where you're, you're now going to be a professional, 
that team drafts you. And I get you know, negotiations that unfortunately we don't have enough time. End up going to Ogden, Utah, and they, they sent me, the Dodgers sent me there because they had a manager that they, they thought was a real good teacher of young men who taught fundamentals well, but also taught about character and about, about commitment, about playing for the front of the jersey and not the back of the jersey. Okay. He taught us about sacrificing. But the first time I met him, I flew into Ogden and I got out of the taxi cab. And there was no Uber back then, but. Um, and walked into the old Ben Loman Hotel, and it, you know when you walk into a, one of those old hotels and it's dark inside, and it takes a minute for your eyes to adjust, and as I walked up to the, to the uh, reservation desk, there was a man about probably 5'10", and a little roly-poly, and he was talking to some guys, looked like guys my age, and as I came closer, he turned around and he, he started walking to me. And as he had gotten in front of me, he said, you must be the Garve. Yes, sir. And he said, son, my name's Tom Lasorda, and your life's changed forever. I thought, oh, my God. What does he mean, my life changed forever? I just signed. I'm a professional player now. What does he mean? Well, what he meant was exactly the things I just, just mentioned. That's now you're not an individual playing in amateur baseball. You're a professional player playing for an organization and being part of a team sacrificing, working together, sweating together, losing together, and hopefully winning more times than you lose, but doing it together. And over that period of time, my, I only played in the minors a couple of years. I was fortunate. The Dodgers were pretty bad, and they needed young players, and like Houston, you know, like the Cubs now. A lot of these teams that are bad for so long, they start getting a lot of first-round draft choices, and all of a sudden, they're pretty doggone good. We all came up together in 1973, and, and uh, in a quick story, I'm, now I've been up a couple years. I was a third baseman with a wild arm, not a big demand for that. 24th man on a 25-man team, which means you're probably pinch hitting in the middle of the game. In 73, I don't have a position, but I start getting pinch hits, and I, all of a sudden I'm leading the National League in, in pinch hitting. And on June 23rd, 1973, there's always a pivotal point in our in our career or lives. Whether it's, it's the day the light turned on or something happened that, that has created an idea or a suggestion, or in this case, the first game of a doubleheader and we'd been struggling against left-handed pitching and I, and I get one of the two hits. And in between games of a doubleheader, I'm sitting in my locker and you know, you feel, you lost, but you feel good that you did your job because you've been getting out there at 2 o'clock every day and working on your skill and trying to be productive and trying to be part of a team. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, the great manager, Walt Alston, remember he was there when I was seven, and now he's still managing. He walks by, and he stops, and he says, uh, you ever play first base? I said, oh, sure. Well, I played one game in Little League and one game with a bad hamstring at AAA. <laughs> And he looked at me and he kind of smiled. He said, well, get a glove. You're starting at first base tonight. So I borrowed a glove and I got the bat boy and I got a ball and went out and I started throwing it around. We only had about five minutes. I said, throw a couple down here so I can pretend like I'm digging them out of the dirt and throw them up here. And the game started and the first inning, I got a ball off the bag and I grab it and tag the runner. Okay, not bad, first time. Two innings later, backhand, ball in the dirt, pick it up. Okay, save a run. Okay. I'm a short first baseman, but I'm down there already, right? Ended up with a couple of doubles. We win the game. And uh, I'm sitting in my locker, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, the days that it comes together. And um, I'm sitting there, and I'm still not dressed yet. Everybody's kind of unwinding. And all of a sudden, I see Walter Olson, the manager, come in and walk by me. And without even stopping, he says, you're in there tomorrow. I look at him. Okay, I've earned another start. And the next day I got two hits and we went on the road and went 10 for 20. And the rest of the season started first base and ended up batting 300. The next season I led the National League in four categories and won the MVP. But that one day, 
When Walter Alston said, have you ever played first base? If I would have thought for a second and said, no, Skipper, I've never played, I probably wouldn't be in front of you right now. Carpe diem. Seize the moment. You get the opportunity, do it. You think you got something special? Go for it, right? You think you can come up with an idea that may revolutionize your industry or your business? Go get them. Carpe diem. 15 years later, 1988, I retired. During that period of time, I went from being a kid at the age of seven with championship players and listening and learning and applying that to my skills and my size and who I am to become a professional baseball player and learning what it's like to have responsibility to your team and to your city and to the game, to your profession. And then realizing it's a profession that's really a short career because it's mostly physical. As time goes on, you, you, you have your great players and you wonder why at 35, 36, 37, they're not starting to hit that ball for a home run they used to hit and they're fouling it off. Right? Remember the first day you realized you needed reading glasses? There's a point in all of our careers when you miss that pitch and you realize, uh-oh, I'm a hundredth of a second slower than I was. I didn't pick that ball up as well as I used to pick it up. And what do you do? Well, now you got to think the game better. You got to start quicker. You got to anticipate. You got to watch the situation between the pitcher and catcher when they throw a curveball, when they throw a change. You've got to think now and overcome what your body is telling you that you're getting older. Right? So, as a professional athlete, you always, you always used to wonder as time went on, why did God give us, this, especially baseball players, this one great skill of playing baseball. It's a round ball and a round bat, and they tell you to do what? Hit it squarely? There's a lot of pretty smart people in this room, and you know how tough that is to do it consistently? Where's the only sport where the defense has the ball? Baseball. Tall, good-looking guy stands on the mound, the pitcher, with a baseball, usually 6'5", good looking, does underwear commercials, works once a week, wants to get paid the same of a poor first baseman that goes out there every day, but don't get me started on pitchers. <laughs> Marcy, that's next year, okay, where are you? There you are. 60 feet, six inches. By the time he strides out, he's 55 feet, he releases the ball at 95 miles an hour, you got four tenths of a second to determine speed, angle, location, get the round bat on the round ball, and hit it squarely. And if you do everything right, there are eight great athletes with big gloves in front of you. Can you outrun the ball? Absolutely not. If I was to toss you the ball right now, that would be about 35, 38, 40 miles an hour. The fastest human, Usain Bolt, runs 28 miles an hour. Can't run the ball. Do everything perfectly. Not going to get on. If you're successful three times out of ten, what happens? You're going to make a lot of money, right? <laughs> three times out of ten. What if you're a surgeon? <laughs> right? Huh? Managing your assets. How about your business? It's not easy, is it? Monetization. It's my new favorite word. <laughs> Last week, it was sustainability. I want to be a chief sustainability officer. Maybe next week, I want to be a chief monetization officer. But it's all tough. What you do is tough. Being creative is tough. Being an entrepreneur is tough. In the end, what it takes is it takes partnership. It takes teamwork. Right? The greatest team in our lives, our family, it's tough. Right? Five daughters, two sons. Somebody said, what are you doing now in your retirement? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> if 
five daughters and two sons, just keeping track of them is a 20-hour day. Just keeping track of the cash flow in their accounts. We were talking about that today is another element of it. But life is to so tough. And then once we leave home, the single toughest job we have in the world, and we go to the workplace, and we're challenged there by knowing that our lives and the lives of our family are predicated on our ability to be creative and to, and to be part of a team and to work together. I mean, there, there are people who are inside people and there are people who are outside people. Right? There's a game on right now. I mean, the entertainment business today is monolithic. I mean, sports, live sports entertainment is the single most driving force in, in media today. Online media, live media, streaming media, whatever it is. And if you go in there now and you see the Dodgers and the Mets on TV, these guys are the authors and the poets of the single most driving force in our society right now. And what is everything else? Sales and marketing, right? It's the ability to get the product or service to the marketplace. And I have a media consulting company and and most of my clients have products and services that are, that are turnover products and services. It's restaurants, it's uh, dog food. Uh, I never thought I'd have a client that's an Indian gaming casino, but they're really good to, to represent. It's a new business, it's an emerging market. That's what society is about right now. I mean, you're in a niche business, right? It's tough, niche business, sounds great. Sounds like there's not a lot of competition, right? That's like any business, creating, developing, producing, delivering. It's kind of like being a ball player, right? But it's not, it's the business world. Every now and then when I get more time, a theme I've had lately is being a business athlete. The same mental skills that it takes to be a successful athlete are the same skills that it takes to be successful in business. It takes passion for what you do. If you don't have passion, you're not into it 100%. Commitment. You gotta be willing to, to take as long as it takes to do those things I just talked about, to get it from idea to implementation. Takes teamwork, ability to work together. I mean, there's a difference between tennis players and golfers, right? They're individual sport players, although a lot of them now, because of the, the money and the nature of the business, they have teams around them. But basically, it's an individual sport. Being an entrepreneur is individual sport. Being creative is, a lot of times, that initial idea is individual. But ultimately, it takes a team. Ultimately, like we said about life, about a family, it takes a village, right? So it's so much more fun to do it together, ultimately, and to do it with relationships that are founded on trust and, and, and honesty. I mean, the single, you've got a handful of virtues in life, and one of the top five is always honesty, and one, one of them that's very close to it is trust. And if we're able to do this in life and in business, then you're gonna have sustainability. You're gonna have longevity. You're gonna have a satisfaction that you don't have unless you have character. And all of these things together lead to, remember the, if you heard the term, he or she was good for so long they became great, right? That's consistency. That's dependability. That's durability. In sports, it's going out there every day. If you've got a, I played 100, I played 1,207 consecutive games. I know, you look at me, hey, he's pretty stumpy. What's the, what's the hurt right there, you know? This takes a little commitment going out every day, you know. Seven and a half years straight, 
I went to my office at first base at Dodger Stadium and old Candlestick Park and Wrigley Field and Shea Stadium. And there were days where I had migraine headaches for a while. I had the flu, pulled hamstring, hairline fracture, hyperextended elbow. Just didn't feel like going out some days. Well, I'll have it. Just don't feel like going to the office. Don't feel like participating that day. Right? But I did it because I had made the commitment, because I had a passion for the game, because I made the commitment to my teammates, made my, my commitment to, this, to the fans who pay their hard-earned money. People say the game's has changed. The game hasn't changed. The business has changed. Business changes all the time. I spoke to a mortgage group, uh, American Pacific Mortgage, uh, last Thursday in, in Southern California. They had a, a summit conference there. Talk about a business that changes. Talk about regulation, constant change in regulation. It drive you crazy. It drives them crazy. Right? It's the nature of their business. And they'll catch a wave and ride it, or it could be 2008, 9, 10, where everything crashes. But how do you tread water, and how do you keep swimming and not drown? It starts from inside out, living your life inside out. Being a businessman and woman who lives your life from the inside out. It's about character and morals and commitment. Somebody asked me, how did you play almost 20 years? I said, because... These are the reasons why. Because I could look in the mirror, and like I, I tell my sons especially, and not necessarily my daughters, although it applies to all of us, the only person you can't fool is, is that person in the mirror. Right? If you can be a good actor or actress, you can be pretty convincing. You can convince a lot of people a lot of things. But that person in the mirror is the one that really knows the truth. So whether you're playing baseball or you're in the technology business or cloud or banking or IT, whatever it is, it never changes. Never changes. The authors and poets are the ones that, are, are the ones that drive the business. But the reason they do it for a long time is because they do it from the inside out. They probably live their lives for their eulogy and not their resume. And I throw this out to you, and I don't have a lot of time today. I want to ask a few questions. But the question you have to always ask yourself, and, and I admire all of you for being here because you're making the time and the effort to share and to learn and to grow, and you're spending your time and money because you want to be better. It's easy to sit home, easy to say it's a lot of traveling, easy to say it's too much money, but to be here and do what you're doing shows me that, that you're doing exactly what I said champions do and winners do. They make the commitment, they have a passion for what they're doing. They want to talk, they want to work together, they want to make a difference. Do a few questions for me right now. Then I'll wrap up with a couple of things. Anybody got any questions for me? Yes, sir. Yeah. The defensive shift? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, yeah, maybe that's good. Um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the question was, what do I think about the, the shift you see defensively in baseball now? And they talk about maybe it should be a, you know, disallowed because nobody ever did it before. And, hey, it's changing times. It's creativity. I just saw a shift on uh, Granderson, the first batter for the Mets, and he had a shot that would have been a one-hop shot to the right fielder, and Rollins caught it 25 feet in the right field. Smart defense, right? They shifted him over, they pitched him in, he had a line drive, somebody was there, good for them. 
You got a better way to make a product? Do it. Right? Want to sell it better? Do it. Right? Another part to that question? Is that answered? That's it. Yeah. I don't believe that you should not allow a collision in home plate, though. But, but that's a whole other conversation right there. <laughs> Old football player, Michigan State. And I, couldn't, I could, couldn't play today unless I hit a catcher once in a while. Yes, sir. You, as the legend in your, in your profession as a baseball player, and what I want to learn and our people here want to learn is what kind of discipline you had in terms of what you ate, what, how did you manage your you know, strength and weight, and most importantly, concentration to be able to do what you did. Could you help us with uh, that background that we can all use? Thank okay. you. Okay, what did I, could you repeat that? What, what did we say? I think the question was how you uh, um, kept yourself or put yourself in such a great shape in these days, yeah? Um, what you ate, how you behaved, how you, how you got the focus ah, yeah. for the game. Good yeah. question, good, yeah. So what you're saying is I, I look much younger than I really am and yeah. what am I doing? <laughs> and by the way, all the people in blue hats today are in the will, by the way. And the black and orange, oh, that, yeah, oh, boy, see, boy, they're going on right now, yeah. Um, you know, it goes back to preparation. Yeah, preparation is, is the, like I said before, is the, it, practice wins championships. Yeah. Individual execution wins games, but practice wins championships. It, it's repetition of doing the right thing over and over again. It's... Uh, it's being good at certain things and working that much harder at your deficiency so that you're at least average. And if there are 10 skills, maybe you got five of them that you're natural at and five that you aren't, making sure that five that you aren't are at least average and letting your superior skills take over from there. I mean, think about this, 162 games in 185 days. Okay. 22, 24 straight days playing in front of crowds of 30, 40, 50,000 people. How many people are booed at work? Anybody booed at work here? Right. Some, of, some of the managers want to do that, but you know, it's socially unacceptable nowadays to boo. But, but, you know, I mean, every day you're going out there, every day you have to be prepared to play, and I was an everyday player. So I had to make sure I got my rest, to make sure I had to eat right. Um, I knew there were two or three restaurants in each town that I could go to and depend on. Uh, I knew that I couldn't turn the air conditioning all the time because one cold room to another, you know. I mean, it's it's smart thing. Do, doing smart things consistently to allow you to get up to the plate, right? In every business, there are times when you get up to the plate and there are times when you prepare to get up there. Then whether you hit a home run or not is is up to you. It's up to your preparation. It's how you approach it, right? Thank the Lord you guys aren't hitting... 89, 99 mile an hour fastballs every day for a living, right? But it's just as tough whatever you're doing. It's just as challenging. So it's all in the preparation. It's all in the dedication and the sustainability of, of consistency. If there's one thing I would wish on all of you, it would be consistency. As a person, um, as a professional, as, as an American or as a citizen, you know, in this great country, consistency. We always look for consistency. Another question? Somebody? Yes. Oh, best pitch. Uh, I faced 14 Hall of Famers. That's a lot. That's a lot of real good pitching going out there. Uh, Nolan Ryan, probably the hardest thrower, right around 100 all the time. Uh, didn't fool around with you, always came at you. Uh, people always ask me, who is the toughest pitcher I ever faced? And everybody expects Nolan Ryan, Tom Seaver, or one of these guys. But it was Phil Necro. And Phil Necro threw the knuckleball. A little bit of a misnomer because you hold it with the, your fingertips, your nails, and you take it back and you don't bend your wrist and you just push the ball. And a lot of times it comes up in the 50 to 60 mile an hour range. But if it doesn't have spin on it, humidity, air blowing out. Like the knuckleball pitchers are the only guys that like the wind blowing out. 
because the non-moving ball into the wind will make it really move like this. So ultimately, this is the equation. He didn't know where it was going. The catcher doesn't know where it's going. And you're supposed to hit it. <laughs> All right. And uh, there were times where Phil Negro Hall of Fame right, was so on. You know, he loved Atlanta, a lot of humidity in Atlanta, loved pitching in Atlanta. We'd get him in LA once in a while, a little drier, ball didn't move as much. But, uh, but one night, <laughs> uh, I never struck out three times in my life. And I uh, faced him the first time, three pitches, took two, missed another one. Next time, uh, took two again, almost got hit, it dove back over here. Another one was outside, I swung and missed. So six pitches, two strikeouts. And uh, now I get up in the, in the sixth inning, and now I'm in an emergency situation. Six pitches, haven't touched the ball yet. So first pitch comes, looks high, drops in. Seven pitches, seven strikes. Next pitch, another one that seems to be at me. I dive out of the way. It drops in, strike two. Eight pitches, eight strikes. I'm facing my first three strikeout game of all time. So what do you do? Okay, I spread out, I get on top of the plate, I crouch over, and I, and being Catholic, I say a few Our Fathers and Hail Marys right away, and I hope it hits me. <laughs> <laughs> because in my mind, if it hits me, I got a hit, right? <laughs> I'm one for three. So, so I get up there, and you know, pitchers, remember I told you they work once a week, they want to get paid the same, you know. When they're smiling at you, it's not a good sign. So he's smiling, oh my Lord, and he throws the ball and it looks like it's gonna be high and it starts to come in and I'm not gonna let the umpire call me out. So I swing and I get on top of it and, and it dribbles down the third baseline. And we're at Dodger Stadium and I take off and I'm running with my head up. I remember Chariots of Fire, remember when he's running on the beach and dun, 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 like this and I'm running. And everything, it seems like I'm never going to get there. And I hit the bag, and there's a big cheer. And I, oh, my Lord, yay, because of the home fans cheer. It's good, right? So I turn around, and the ball had died right on the third base chalk, right, right on the line. So I come back. I feel pretty good about myself now. I'm one for three. And uh, Manny Mota, the great Dominican who was coaching at the time, comes up, and he puts his arm around me, and he said, uh, Steve, I said, yeah, Manny. He said, you're a very lucky man. you very, very lucky. <laughs> I said, I know, Manny. I know. You go to church. I said, I know I'm going to church somewhere like that. But knuckleball pitchers, you know, were always the worst. I was a guesstimator and tracker, and they, they drove me crazy. Another question? Somebody? Yeah? Somebody? Ladies' question? Yes. Great. I just wanted to ask about how do you, like when you went through slumps, yeah. you know, there could be a temptation to, to tinker with your swing or to try to make adjustments maybe too often mm -hmm. versus saying, you know, fundamentally my, my swing is sound. I know that I'm going to come back out of this slump. So how did you find the balance between making adjustments when needed yet not tinkering with things too much when you should just say, I really know fundamentally what I'm doing is right and I don't need to change? Are you married to a ball player? <laughs> no. If but you're I'm not, <laughs> and I was, you know, still playing in a, I would marry you because that's some great stuff right there. I'm telling you. Do you have you played? Will, Do you play I softball? A, I, we won a couple of state championships in Maryland when I was in high school. So yeah, yeah I, you're pretty <laughs> I've good. Played. Well, and and what we're talking about here is when you're in a slump, and psychologically, it could be life too. You know, we, we us human beings have a tendency to compound things. You know, things are probably never quite as good as we think, and they're probably not quite as bad. But in our mind, we compound them. And especially in a slump, every slump I had, and fortunately I have too many, started off by me hitting three line drives in a game. And right at people. So then the next game, I would, you know, okay, maybe I'll get a little higher. You know, maybe I'll close up a little bit. And the next game, you pop up twice, hit one hard, you're 0 for 4. Eh, you're 0 for 8. So now you decide to drop your hands down a little, or maybe you're facing Nolan Ryan the next day and he's on, so you're 0 for 4 again, no matter what you do. And now all of a sudden you're 1 for 22 and you basically weren't bad to begin with, right? But we compound it by overthinking a lot of times. So what I would do is, is after probably excuse me, six or seven years, I started bunting and to get out of slumps, and I was more of a line drive power hitter, um, 
third base may be back, I would drop, drop it down, surprise him, get to first base, get a hit, right? So then what happened was I started to get a reputation that Garvey can bunt, so the third baseman would come in even with a bag 10 feet in, which then what would happen? Well, I'd probably get 10 more hits because the third baseman was in more than if he was back, right? So I ended up probably hitting 20, 25 points higher just by the ability to bunt. Right? Think about it. Just by bunting. Then I taught myself how to hit and run, maybe five, six times a year. That's another 10 points. So by just doing two things, bunting and hitting and running, small ball, I ended up batting 35 points more on my average and became that much more of an offensive threat and a player. Right? But that's adjusting in your, in your business, taking what's, what's given you. A lot of times we're so thick-headed that we don't take what's given us in our profession. If somebody's going to give you something, somebody's going to give you help, somebody's going to, third baseman's going to play back, drop down a bunt. If the runner is not so, not so fast and he takes off and they cover, hit it that way, it's a big hole, 80 feet of a hole that way. Take advantage that way. But the final summation of your question is, the more you can make minor adjustments, the better off you're going to be. If you actually know what you're doing, to make a drastic change in, in, in your thinking or, or your philosophy probably isn't going to work and is going to, in the long run, take you backwards. There. One more question, I know. Yes? Uh, first of all, your team is 33 to nothing. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm a Mets fan, so I don't feel good about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I think we evolve as who we are in our, in our physical and mental capabilities. And, uh, and, and the thing nowadays is, when, at the end of my career, we were using eight-track tapes and a little recorder behind home plate. And you take your eight-track tape home that night, if you wanted to, and look at your at-bats. And there was no back, forward, no split-screen analysis. Nowadays, every team has a video room. You can go in and break down your swing break down your swing and your approach against every pitcher that you face, look at the opposing pitcher, break him, they break him down. I mean, it's phenomenal. But the problem now is you're talking about you get so much information, it's information gridlock if you let it consume your, your thinking. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, you know what still basis comes down to? See it and hit it, right? Get up there, get ready, take that round bat, and hit that round ball when, it, when you can reach it. Right? Sabermetrics is, is, is choking a lot of players and teams now because it's too much information when you got four tenths of a second to execute a, a, the single toughest skill to do in, in sports. So all these things are technically good. You can use some of them, but if you rely on them as a crutch, then it's going to really gridlock you and probably suppress you as a, as a performer, individual. All new things are good for you in moderation, I think. I don't know about what you have to say in your business. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different situation, I would think. But again, you have to modify every good idea and adjust it and implement it and develop it. And like we said before, pipeline, marketing, sales. Uh, yes? Um, I had a question. How do you get a thick skin? How do you get a thick skin? Yeah, like I want to be a team player, and you know, I'm sure everybody does, but once in a while somebody will say something that really pisses you off, and how do you just kind of ignore it and go forward? Because it must happen in baseball. Like, for oh. example, my daughter is an Olympian for a U.S. Olympic athlete for the sport of skeleton. She's got is, good genes. Yeah, yeah. well. Yeah. And uh, she she is supposed to compete, but then she gets all these little bitchy things to get in their head so that she she gets upset and she doesn't perform as well as she should be. So how do you get like a thick skin so you could just do your thing without letting like, you know, people bug you? It's, a, it's an excellent question. I, I have a, a simple answer and, and then a, a quick story. 
Um, number one is the, the difference between good and great are two things, balance, physical balance, and the mental ability to compartmentalize and to maintain your focus, right? To take extraneous things and, and, and block them out somehow by over, by over focusing on what you need to do. When I say over focus, over blocks out the other and focuses on what you do. Staying within yourself. Nowadays, it's headsets. I mean, these kids get these headsets on, and who knows where they are? Who knows what the music is? Who knows what's talking to them in the in the earphones? But difference between good and great is the ability to do that. Uh, they go, all the great athletes have great balance. It's Jerry Rice going over the middle. It's Michael Jordan switching hands. It's uh, uh, Bryce Harper hitting all these guys hitting squaring up and hitting 450 foot home runs. Right? And the other thing is, if you ever let somebody in the crowd get to you, you're sunk. You're done. Once they know they got you, it becomes contagious. Um, so, 1974, I finally win the MVP for the Dodgers. We come to Candlestick, play the Giants. Heated rivalry. It's always. You know, 18 to 35 males wearing jumpsuits in July because the chill index is 32, drinking, right? It's a terrible crowd. So first time in 1975, we're taking batting practice, and I hear this, Garvey, get a haircut. Garvey, get a haircut. Now I was always, you know, short hair and everything, and this guy was trying to get me by saying, hey, get a haircut, right? For... 10 years, every time in, Garvey, get a haircut. Garvey never turned around once. Never acknowledged him, never looked at him, because why? Once you look at him, they got you. So the Dodgers make me an offer I can refuse, 1982. I end up being a padre. I come in for the first time in April. We're taking batting practice. Garvey, get a haircut, right? So finally, I said, I'm not a Dodger anymore. I turn around, I look up, and here's a guy with hair down to his waist. He's got a Dodger jacket on, and he's dancing, yelling, finally, finally, he turned around, finally. finally. And, and he, I said, come on. So he comes down, we're next to the dugout, and I get a bat. And I said, what are you doing? Why didn't you yell you were a Dodger fan? Or, and he said, after a while, it just got to be a game that how long could it go before I could get you to turn around? And, but, but I, I learned if you turn around, whether it's Wrigley Field and the guy's right here, or whether it's Atlanta, Fulton County, where they're far away, or whether it's Candlestick Park, once you acknowledge it, then you're sunk. That's that compartmentalization that's focusing, blocking it out. And I got a bat and signed it for him, and he carried. Every time we'd come in and have the bat and his Dodger jacket on, even when I was at the Padres, yeah, for sure. Uh, we run out of time, I'm quite sure. Another question, anybody? We have run out of time long ago, but it was fun listening to you. <laughs> really, really. Thank you very much. The general Thank managers. You. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.